All right, we're back. It's uh, Comp 391. Um, it's Intro to Game and Simulation. It says week two. We're actually on week three. We're a little behind on the on the theory side. Uh, we're still doing stuff with Blender today, uh, but I just wanted to uh, to make sure we've got all this piece down so that way we can get through some of this, the pieces that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, last week we talked more in terms of platforms uh, and uh, the week before. Um, we were talking about kind of an intro and a history to games. This week we're going to be talking more on um, genres and, and goals. What, like, why do we, uh, why do we make games? What kind of games are there? Um, and what, again, it's, all these three weeks so far are all about design choices. Like when we make games, it influences our not only our design but the coding that we're going to use and the, and the uh, our planning, right? So we're going to be talking about things like um, if we had other non-entertainment style games, like uh, games for simulation, games for uh, edutainment, uh, games for gamification, which we'll talk about a little bit today, those kind of things. Um, they might have different goals in mind than games that are for just pure entertainment value, right? And uh, there's also different kinds of genres. So we're probably going to cover the first two uh, to some degree today and cover the rest on, uh, on Friday, right? Just as a reminder for those people who are going to volunteer, Friday um, is the all-day thing, 8.30 in the morning um, until, I guess, the afternoon, until we start class, <laughs> 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're going to have Senator O'Connor here. Uh, we're going to do this little workshop for them. So if you've already kind of sent me an email, just uh, giving you a heads up that Friday, uh, we're going to do that workshop. I know, kind of went quick. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. It was a couple weeks out. Now it's Friday. <laughs> That's how we go. Um, so again, there's there's a couple of reasons why we make a game. Like, why do we why are we making a game? It's, it's not just for money. I mean, obviously, money is a driver, right? Because we want to make games to make money to to you know uh, have a livelihood uh, and so on. But um, there's reasons why we make games. Um, with different drivers. Um, so one of them is, for example, to entertain, to educate, support, to market, different things, the reason why we do the things we do. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to read all this. Again, these slides, when I finally put all of them up, are for you, for your reference. Um, next week, by the way, um, speaking of slides and all that kind of stuff, I may do a short test on um, stuff we've covered already. So anything we've kind of put up until this week, uh, including Blender and all that stuff. There might be two parts of it. One, one part might be a um, kind of the theory piece, some questions, and Q and A, uh, true, false, multiple choice, that kind of thing. Right from our material, like I'm not, I'm not going to make anything up, anything that we've talked about, anything that's in our videos, that kind of thing. And then we'll do a, maybe a short. I may ask you to build something in Blender, like within within a short time frame. So I'll say here, I want you to build X, you know, this whatever it's going to be, and you'll have some instructions on what to do things together for next week. So let's talk about uh, entertainment. The goals of entertainment, um, when we talk about entertainment, um, we want to talk about things like, we want to kind of escape from the daily stress of life. I think this is a good, this is a good line online, the second point here. We, you know, we kind of come in to de-stress, to just enjoy ourselves, uh, to have fun, those kind of things. I think this is one of the main ones, um, more than any reason. Why people? Why do people game? Is the is the question here, right? We game because we enjoy competition. We game because we enjoy um, having fun, right? Those are the main reasons. If you ask a kid, different ages, um, as as you go into adulthood, there's different reasons why we game. Um, like for example, I know I, I played forget video games, but I I, I play a lot uh, of games for the competition value, right? Um, if you ever played any kind of desktop games like Warhammer 40K or something like that where you model, yeah, I don't know if you guys ever done that, right? But um, Or even competitive Dungeons & Dragons or something crazy like that, which is a different kind of thing, almost like tournament, tournament play. Yes, they have that. Um, where you have, you, you're given a character. This is your character, and you're playing, and this is the dungeon, and then they mark you on your performance, right? Um, you know, those kind of things. And those things happen normally inside of a convention kind of um, framework, right? Where you go to that venue, and then you've already signed up for your tournament play, um, and, and so on. And then you can win a prize or whatever. Tournament turn, tournament kind of play. You get points for, for this kind of stuff. And then you can go, if you follow the convention circuit for all Dungeons & Dragons uh, kind of live, I'm using Dungeons & Dragons as an example, then what they do is they... Uh, 
they carry your points forward, and you can qualify literally, like just like any other tournament. You, there's a qualifier to get into another tournament, um, different kind of play. But again, the goals, the key performance indicators for these kind of things is slightly different than, for example, playing a tournament for Dota 2. You know, it's a different thing if you're playing that or Hearthstone or whatever the, uh, the, the latest and greatest games are for, for, uh, for com competition. So I think we play for entertainment, but um, there's two piece parts to that. One is for fun, the other one is for challenges or competition. And here's an example of uh, uh, kind of an older game, Uncharted 2 Among Thieves. Uh, then there's the social aspect. You can There's different kinds of social games. I mean, I can't tell you how many uh, games have been made for Facebook that I keep on saying no to. No, I'm not playing that game. I'm not playing, you know, uh, uh, this game or the other game, Candy Crush Saga. I don't want to play that game. Don't send me that, that invite anymore, right? Uh, but people play it all the time. There's all kinds of stuff uh, that they play from a social aspect where they play, uh, you know, to kind of show that, um, you know, um, they're playing this game. How much? How much? How many points do they get? Um, other kinds of kind of um, they're kind of community type games where you play and you compare your score versus other people uh, that play along with you, not just uh, in a cooperative or um, head versus head to head kind of game format. Um, so, from a social aspect, definitely there's 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 like the goal of, of of playing a social kind of game where you have inline chat. Uh, and, and that kind of thing, and to connect with other people, right, or have the experience of playing alongside someone else when they're physically not with you, <laughs> right, which is kind of, I mean, and it speaks uh, to, our, uh, to our society a little bit in that, um, you know, we'd rather go into our rooms and play a game socially than actually meet socially, right, <laughs> just kind of weird. Let's go play the game together and defeat the, the monsters, but you know what, I don't want to have a beer with you today, I don't have time for that. I have time to send you a text message today, but I don't have time to call you because, you know, text messaging is just easier and faceless, right? And I don't have, I really don't, I don't really have time to chit-chat with you. I just have to send you two, two simple messages. So let's text each other, right? Or let's, let's chat. There's other things too, um, you know, other reasons, but I think we covered them all. Um, there's one that's around character maintenance or um, the world maintenance also, like, you know, where you kind of go in, um, it's a, it's almost like a, like you have a, it's like a turn by turn type of environment where you do your thing, you do your character maintenance until they stop making, you know, whatever they're going to do. Like for example, you might have a farming type of game where you go in and you do your farming and then when you're, when the farming is producing its crops, you know, in the middle of producing your crop, you stop playing the game, you leave. And then in the background, the server calculates how many turns you've been away. And when you come back, you know, the crops, crops come out and you have to do your, your maintenance, and you keep coming back and forward to the game, it drags you in, and then you have more social interaction, right? So it's almost like uh, the goal of the game to drag you into it, you know, and that's why they do this maintenance. So world maintenance, character maintenance, where you have to, uh, as in The Sims, you have to make sure that they, they go, to, go to sleep, that they eat, you know, those kind of things. Um, and you can automate some of the, that functionality as well. I'm not going to talk about this. I kind of talked about it, but... Here's a good example of, uh, of kind of a, a past game that was uh, fairly popular. Again, this is going back to 2012. Now, for the last three years, there's been a million more games that are more popular than this one. Educational games. Um, and when we talk educational games, I mean things made for education, to get to educate. Um, and I think the, the whole term edutainment, where you kind of, it's entertaining to learn. Um, a lot of it's geared towards kids, right, where you want to learn things like how to, how to read online, um, those kind of things. But further than, than just for kids, there's other kinds of simulations. Like, for example, I want to learn how to fly a plane, right? So there's these actual cockpit simulation games that are made for the military and for flight training schools, where before you actually get into um, a real plane, this flight simulator looks pretty, pretty good. It's all digital, so there actually aren't any switches or whatever to throw. Uh, but you kind of do a little bit more on the online simulators to, to get a feel of all the controls, but they're the exact same controls you use in a real real life scenario, right? And actually, there's a three step process now. Um, if you're in in some flight schools, what they have is um, they have a I don't know a cutaway uh, cockpit, right? Which looks like almost like a real plane, right? And then uh, which is your simulator. So you actually go in the simulator. 
And then there's also the online type version of uh, your flight simulator game where you play and it looks very similar. Obviously, you want to get the, the flight simulator time is really expensive, and there's only a limited amount of people that can play in a real simulator where you kind of walk in and physically, you know, play with the switches. Um, and so you're controlling the game. The viewpoint looks almost like a virtual reality that you're flying the actual plane, but you haven't fl flown the plane yet. And the reason for that is because you want to train the p potential pli pilot uh, to do takeoffs and landings, to perform emergency maneuvers, all these kind of things that you can't do you know, in real life. Because if they perform an emergency maneuver in real life and they crash your plane, right? <laughs> you know, planes are what? At least even the cheapest ones are like millions, right? 30 million, 10 million. So you're looking at, and potential loss of life is also the other reason. So this is why we do simulations, and there's a really good reason for this. Um, and there's so many other kinds of simulations out there that, that could be played for the purpose of teaching as opposed to, uh, you know, just pure, uh, pure fun. Sometimes also, uh, from a distance learning perspective, um, you know, you, I kind of talked about this a little bit, how... Um, e-learning is really boring as hell. Like we play, you know, you, you get a, an e-learning kind of course you have to do uh, because, you know, it's, maybe it's a component. You want to do one component that's in class and then another component that's online. And the online components are boring as hell, right? Uh, even if it's an interesting material, it doesn't matter. It's just the way it's presented. Um, so there's a whole space. There's a whole, um, I would say, a vacuum of, of uh, an area that if you wanted to make games to, to educate, like almost like, the, I, I'm, I hate to use this dirty word, gamify, right? Gamification, we kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, it's, it's really an industry that, that is growing, that's out there, that's in demand uh, to create almost like, you know, things like uh, badges and stuff like that. A good example of that, and I'll take you just to a website that I really like. I think there's a, there's a uh, if you want to learn AngularJS, right? Um, they've kind of created almost like a game-like environment. So let's go to that. Let's go to angularjs.org. For you people, if you want to check this out, if you want to go to learn, they've got a free course here on angularjs.org uh, that is hosted by, actually paid for by Google, right? And um, if you look through there, if I go to uh, uh, to learn, I'm not sure if we're allowed to look at it from here, but if you, it's actually campus.codeschool.com. Code School has been paid for uh, by um, by Google, right? Uh, to create this, you know, um, shaping up with Angular uh, course, right? And the great thing about this, again, it's like any other online course. They have a little movie, and uh, let me see if I can play the movie for you. The Flatlanders need a store to sell their gems and more. They need it really quick. Angular will do the trick. They talk about this kind of stuff. I don't want to go too much into it because then YouTube will shut me down for playing their music, right? But anyways, the the idea here is that they do what they do in this course is they do a little movie, right? Which is kind of cool. Uh, and the movie is all around the topic, right? Uh, so a little, almost like music video. And what they have is a person that's in, uh, sitting in front of a green screen, right? And he, so you see the instructor, and the instructor's talking about his, his, his subject. And what they're teaching at the same time is AngularJS, which is a very popular, I would say, probably the number one front-end framework nowadays for JavaScript, right? Um, Go ahead. If you want to try this to learn this stuff on your own, not today, but another day, uh, the course is free and it's, again, sponsored by Google, produced by Code School, and um, you get these badges and points for doing your, uh, the course. Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think you get anything for it. Like there is even, so what if you get points or you get 200 points for, for doing this? But it, they kind of almost create this gamified experience, which is, I think, a novel approach to, to learning, right? Um, I think in the future they're going to have more than just badges, but maybe potential uh, bonuses and so on. Like imagine a, a, um, a company, a corporation that, that's trying to encourage its users to do things like learn about um, uh, health and safety, because health and safety is big topics these days in, in corporations and in, in, in the workforce, right? Health and safety is the most boring subject in the world, right? It's like it's almost as bad as, you know, uh, um, real estate law. It's really bad, right? Uh, I'm saying it's like, you know, and or accounting. If you want to learn accounting best practices and so on, it's it's quite dry material, right? But imagine now if you can gamify this, and again, there's no other word that I can think about it. I know some people like to use engaged learning or whatever, some other kind of uh, uh, words. But at the end of the day, there's this edutainment aspect to it where you not only are you learning, but you're also gaining points 
and maybe from a corporation perspective, you can get a bonus based on how, how much you, uh, how fast you finish it, how much you know. Um, I'll tell you right now, if you do this uh, AngularJS, there is an actual hands-on part to it as well, like a practical piece where you actually learn how to, um, how to program. And the game piece, it's not actually you playing the game, the game piece is you're getting awarded by getting badges. So that's the gamification piece. I think they can take this further where not only can you get badges and get points for learning Angular Dress, but also some kind of game where you understand stuff more uh, about um, things like uh, building custom directives um, and and all this kind of stuff that are that are for um, that you know you build with Angular Js. So that's kind of an example, a recent example of, of one that they got out there right now. So again, a big demand. I would say there's there's almost like a uh, there's kind of there's there's something missing uh, today in terms of the way we educate. Think about us here in in, uh, in colleges and universities, right? We've taken this course. This is a great example of this. Imagine if I could continue to if we if we had almost like this <coughs> gamification piece to it. So not only are you learning, but you're playing, right? To me, it's always more fun. Now, there is an opponent to this whole process which says, you know, if I force you, if I, um, you know, uh, make you learn, right, if I'm trying to force you to do something you don't want to do, at the end of the day, no matter how much I get you to play, it's not effective. Because really, it's all around your motivation. So if whether you want to do it or not, for me to get you to play a game to do it as opposed to you doing it on your own, if you don't want to do it, it's, it's a contrived process that may or may not work anyway. So that's the, that's the critical side of this. To me, I'm all for it. I think there's, like I said, a big market for this. And you're going to see, uh, you know, educational kind of games growing in leaps and bounds. There are some um, other examples uh, that the book has that they talk about uh, in terms of uh, puzzle games. Again, the puzzle games would be the kind of stuff that you would, when you play the puzzle game, and, and this is where I think it would work well with something like AngularJS, then the puzzle game idea is, the you know, you learn how to do by by you know, kind of uh, figuring out the puzzle, right? They give you some information, and then you use the puzzle to figure things out, right? To kind of you play a puzzle game to do that, and the puzzle doesn't have to be actually like a, a physical or visual puzzle; it can be something else. Um, so they gave some examples of uh, some a couple games here from from 2010 or 2012 that were pretty popular, like learning how to play uh, music, uh, everything from that to. Uh, uh, talking about things like um, history or something else. So you play a game to learn a particular subject. Um, here's another section, recruiting and training, which is, you know, something that they've, um, it's really big. And we talked a bit on the training side with the flight simulator idea. But from a recruiting perspective, they actually have a game that they made uh, with americasarmy.com. I don't know if you've heard of it. Maybe you have. Yeah which is you know, one of the first uh, simulations that they came up with from uh, the military, where they try to get you interested um, to play the game and all that kind of stuff. You learn about you know, what the recruitment process is and so on. And again, it's, it's a marketing tool. It's a way of you understanding without actually um, uh, having any fear of going. They kind of brief you on what's going to be there and all this kind of stuff, and you play a game at the same time. right? So that's kind of cool. If you want to check it out, it's actually uh, quite interesting. Um, you know, there's, there is a um, discussion, and, a, and it, it can cause controversy that should we use, <laughs> it's, not, it's not can we, but the question would be, should we use these kind of games to, uh, to recruit and all that kind of stuff? And uh, because of the whole aspect of, you know, we're recruiting for the military, right? <laughs> Do we really want to recruit people with games to kill other people, right? I'm just saying, right? Or even they might, they might talk about, you know, um, uh, defense, you're, you know, you're, you're kind of you're being recruited into the military to defend the nation, right? Uh, but then there's this whole controversy around that. And again, it comes, then we get to the point where we talk about, uh, again, this whole idea of we're, we're making it for profit, right? We're recruiting people, to, to, we're almost like, you know, creating an environment for them so they feel more comfortable doing something that they're afraid of doing, right? So again, uh, this whole idea for us is, should we or shouldn't we? And then it comes down to some of the games that are made out there right now. Uh, people are afraid to make them. An example of that would be uh, pornography with for VR. 
I'm just putting it out there. Here's a topic, right? You got VR, like your uh, whole, you know, your Microsoft HoloLens. Huh? Yeah, let's talk about this a little bit, but it's going to come up, right? And then uh, the, the pornography industry is huge, right? But, and we can probably do it. We can probably create, like, you know, holographic porn, no problem, right? Should we do it? And that's the question. It's going to be done. I, I guarantee you, as soon as the uh, things like, you know, your um, Oculus Rift and stuff become more mainstream, and the HoloLens become something that you can buy in the store, guaranteed you'll be able to do something like you can, uh, something with HoloLens. Yeah. I know it's done, but I mean, just wait till, the, the, till it's mainstream, I'm saying. It's not really mainstream yet. It's there. You know, they've talked about it a lot, but, you know, you're going to see it come out. And there's going to be a lot of controversy around this, right? Um, especially with the whole idea of, um, you know, I mean, over the last, I would say, 10 years, uh, the idea of online dating and everything else has really become more mainstream. And you, you're more comfortable with it, right? And uh, we'll talk about recruiting and training. Think about recruiting you know, you're, you're the perfect mate <laughs> for you for, for, you know, this kind of thing, right? Creating a profile for yourself on online dating and then, um, you know, this kind of thing. Um, can, you, can you not see a possibility of you playing a game to connect with somebody else? And uh, someone who's more like you, who likes playing the same type of games as you and all that kind of stuff. may not be a video game the way we see it today. It may not be a shooter, You're not shooting each other uh, necessarily, but... Um, or imagine creating a, a, a game where you, it's a simulation of having a date. I hate to say it that way, and it's really ugly to me, because I've always thought about online dating as, you know, I, again, I'm a little bit old school. I love games, but this is where I kind of cut, the, you know, kind of draw the line for myself, which is if you really need, you know, to, to do online dating to find somebody, you know, it talks to uh, the state of social, social state of affairs right now in, in the world. Um, I always kind of look at that, and, and if you take it one step further, where you actually, you know, you're not really dating, but you're virtually virtually meeting somebody, that's to the next level, right? And I think it's possible, and I think it will happen. I think you're gonna be you're gonna be you're gonna kind of create rooms where you can virtually see somebody else in their virtual form, um, and you're gonna go there with your VR helmet or your whatever it's gonna be tomorrow, or your chip in the eye, whatever, and you're gonna see something that doesn't really exist in real life, right? And you're going to have an interaction that's safe that you can cut off at any moment. Okay, I'm, cancel I'm canceling this date. You know, press the button and now, you know, you're gone. And, and you can do this anywhere in the world. So you can meet, you know, date a girl or a guy uh, who's in a different country. Like, you know, you're dating and you're virtually meeting. You're sitting down and having a virtual drink, you know, or whatever. Maybe you're having a real drink. I don't know. But at the end of the day, this is the kind of stuff that um, um, it goes one step further with this whole idea of recruitment, right? Um, we want to recruit people to join a company. We want to recruit people uh, to join us. And we're going to use games to do it. Yeah. You like that one? Human sim. We're, we're actually, uh, you're using uh, a simulator to, you know, to, uh, um, uh, to do surgery, this kind of idea, right? Health and fitness games are huge, right? I mean, ever since the, I think the big one for me was when, uh, the Wii came out with their, their, you know, their Wii Fit and all that stuff. Uh, you know, when I first saw that game out, when it came out on the, on the Wii, I was like, I got to get that. <laughs> I was one of the stupid people that got it with the whole platform that you stood on and everything else, the balance board. It was neat. It was a neat idea for you to be able to count your calories. and you, They made you do exercises and all this kind of stuff. If you're into the whole fitness thing, it was a way of mixing exercise and fitness. And then, of course, of course they came up with all these dancing games. Hey, Vanessa, right? Hey, Vanessa, I made your, I put your, your name on, uh, talked to you on YouTube that said you're, you're an internet sensation now. You should take over from Cherry Blossom. But anyways, um, so, you know, they have all this, uh, this stuff where they, um, you know, you play these games, Dance Dance Revolution, uh, different kind of dancing games out there. Uh, Just Dance, right? Just Dance is the big one. Uh, I know that uh, my kids always get it every year. Just Dance 2015. We're gonna get another, we're gonna get another one. Just Dance 2016. Right? It's coming. Right? And every time they include a few more songs that you can dance to, and some crazy hip hop or something else. There's no way you could do it unless you did this full time. I know people do Dance Dance or a Revolution or Just Dance those kind of things at home for fitness. They actually, you know, they do it because they want to uh, they want to lose weight or they want to uh, dance, they enjoy dancing the music. Right? Um, it's interesting to me because, again, it speaks to, can I work out at home? The whole idea of the home gym, it kind of, it kind of uh, aligns with that nicely, 
right? Why do people do things at home? Why do they have a home gym, right? So they don't have to meet other people. <laughs> they want to do it on their own, or it's convenient. One of the two things. They don't have time to go to the gym, so they build a home gym. They build, they get a they get a treadmill. They get all the stuff. So imagine now you don't need any of that stuff. All you need is your body weight, right? Body weight exercises and uh, some a coach, which is an online coach, which is what uh, We Fit has and other games like that. Um, there's so many out there now, uh, you know, to try and get you to uh, to do this kind of stuff. It's almost like how we used to do it. We used to put a videotape in and follow the uh, the aerobic you know aerobic class online, right? It was the same idea, but this time now you have a coach that says, okay, you can go a little faster, or you're a little off, try that again, you know, those kind of things, right? Whereas, uh, whereas before we didn't have that. So I think this, there's, a, there's still quite a huge market for health and fitness type games. Think about the, all the wearables that are coming out these days, right? 99% of all our wearables are all wearable fitness, uh, you know, kind of trackers of some sort or another, right? Whether you have it from, uh, uh, and how, are, how can you, imagine if you had a fitness tracker that was for, made for a console. So you kind of, you know, you're playing a game and like the Wii, and now you have a true fitness tracker that keeps track of, of your calories, you know, very, very clearly. You go jog outside and come back in, you get some points, right? <laughs> or whatever, you're gonna go on the treadmill or work out and you get points and it, and it adds into the social aspect of the game. Uh, and there's different apps, like actual uh, iPhone apps and, and uh, Android apps that actually connect to, um, you know, to that. Um, an example of that would be MyFitnessPal. Um, that keeps track of your calories and so on, and you get points. And then uh, there's a social aspect where you can share your, your uh, um, you know, how you did this week with people in your network, right? Uh, and the same thing with Map My Fitness and uh, Map My Run and different things like that. There's other apps out there that, do, that does kind of, they do the same thing and they kind of, um, uh, you know, gamify the whole uh, exercise experience. Another one would be Fitocracy. If you look at that, there's another app like that. Um, all these different apps that, that help you, uh, whether they're mobile apps or they're, they're, um, they're console games or whatever, that help you or make you feel that you're going to um, work out. And it's easier and it's fun and you can do it on your own. This is interesting. The stats say that uh, um, a recent study over the last five years or so say that uh, surgeons who played games for three or more hours a week made 37% fewer, mis fewer mistakes. <laughs> I like that. Get those surgeons to play the damn games, eh? Because I don't want them to make, make a mistake with my heart or something crazy like that one day. Um, the other one was that the, uh, they're 27% faster than their counterparts because they get this whole hand-eye coordination thing by playing these fast switch games, right? Interesting. And there's a good example of um, EA Sports Active 2 with the Wii. We fit. Um... This is where I, you know, it's, this is kind of a little bit outside of my experience in terms of lifestyle type games, games that you want to play uh, to kind of expand your consciousness and and uh, and all this kind of thing. Um, there's a couple titles that they talk about here. I looked them up: Darfur is dying and and uh, a redistricting game. These are kind of games that you know kind of give you awareness of different uh, social issues and those kind of things that exist today that maybe you don't want to talk about or maybe you, that kind of drag you into understanding the issues more. A little bit more than if you were just having a uh, you read a paper on it. Again, not my type of game. I'm not so sure if it's your type of game, but they're out there, right? So just to, you know, it's just an educational piece to understand, uh, you know, uh, kind of the goal of, of why these games have been made. Almost again, mostly by non nonprofit organizations, uh, politically or uh, you know, a politically driven game or a religious kind of game to make you understand uh, or to give you some. Um, to fill in a gap in terms of uh, your religious understanding or political understanding or values, attitudes, life, whatever. I want to mention it. I'm not going to talk too much about it because, you know, from my I, again, for myself, uh, it's not something that I'm interested in doing. I don't usually look at the computer to play, you know, games about social, you know, how to be uh, socially good, right? But that's just me. Um, aesthetics and creativity. There's tons of games out there like that. I remember things like uh, even games that weren't made on uh, uh, online or with video games like Lightbright. I don't know if you guys ever saw, you ever remember that, but you actually put some lights together and create almost like a game with lights, an electronic game, um, or drawing type of games where you kind of draw, um, you know, it's like a game, but it's, it's not just a drawing program, but an actual game where you can play to win, right? Um, there's all kinds of stuff out there where you can um, create stuff. Um, an offshoot of that is things like where you play stuff. Like you play instruments, 
So you create music. Um, Guitar Hero was kind of like the first one where you actually, it was kind of, it's almost, it's almost like this. It's almost back to this whole idea of, of uh, health and fitness. You know, it's kind of a mix of, I don't know if you've ever played Guitar Hero lately, but it's like, it's intense. <laughs> like, you know, especially on the higher levels where you play extreme or something or crazy. Um, you know, it can be very, very, I mean, I don't know how many times I've jammed my thumb, you know, playing that stupid game, right? Um, especially some of the later versions of Guitar Hero and those kind of games, uh, guitar type games, where you actually have to know the notes and know how to play guitar, right? There's, there's games where you actually, if you know how to play guitar, it's not just like um, hitting the notes, but actually playing the guitar to compete. Um, and this is where I see this an aspect of this, how it fits with this creativity stuff, where you have, you know, this is an example of Guitar Hero World Tour, where you can kind of share instruments. Um, they used to have that. Um, it's kind of waned. It's not as much. Say The whole Guitar Hero thing was a big fad for, I would say, good two or three years. And then afterwards, it just kind of, um, it went away. But not that it's not going to be, it's not going to ever be back. I think it's great from a, if you have three or four people that can play it with you, uh, the challenge is that you don't always have three or four people that you can play it with you. And then even playing um, with groups that are not physically in your location, like if you're playing online with somebody else, there's a bit of latency. <laughs> you can't, I don't know if you ever tried it. But it's, uh, uh, it's definitely not as easy uh, to do it as opposed to, uh, you know, doing it with someone physically there. So there's the disadvantage, right? But I think it was definitely something that, that came out where um, you're creating art, you know, because you're trying to follow along with a song. And I can't tell you how much fun you, you can have by actually doing, um, you know, something like that. If you've never done Guitar Hero or some kind of singing game, you know, Lips from, from the Xbox, they used to have that. There's a bunch of them out there. And um, where you can actually add your own ad lib and stuff like that and add your own stuff for extra points. I think this kind of goes into the creativity aspect. Uh, this one's interesting. That game company's flow and flower, right, where you can actually create art uh, by playing the game is, is very interesting. And I actually showed you one before, which is that whole, um, there's some apps that, that came out um, for... Um, for different uh, platforms, for example, Android and iOS have this Node Beat game, or that, that's fairly recent, that you can make your own music by, you know, putting a bunch of nodes and floating them around and then connecting notes and so on uh, to create your own music and so on. There's a lot of games like that now uh, that are not for for, def uh, for points, but rather for the output is something that you would create in the end. And they're very popular. People pay for those games. Like, uh, Node Beat, I think it's a dollar ninety nine, <laughs> right? Which of course my daughter and my son like love, right? So of course I had to buy a dollar ninety nine this this game across all my platforms. Um, so can you imagine the money they made? Lots and lots of of marketing and advertising type games, tons and tons of them, more than I'd like to even talk about, right? Uh, where you play a game, um, you know, because uh, you know you're interested in a product. And the, the product itself gives you these, you know, kind of a little game to play to get you more interested in the product. Um, some of this would be, you know, I mean, it's kind of, when I say marketing and advertising, it's not just about products, but even about movies, where you might have a movie type game, um, you know, before the movie comes out to, to create excitement. Part of their marketing strategy is to create an online game or a puzzle. Uh, and so it's part of the game. If you know the environment, then you know the, about what uh, things about the movie, you can play the game. And then you learn more about the movie. It might unlock an Easter egg, something that you're going to learn about that you can, uh, you know, uh, that they're going to talk about in the movie, and so you get the reference. You know, like one of those things. And uh, oftentimes, I find big movies come out like that. Um, things like Avatar, um, other big movies come out with with these kind of games to get you excited. Harry Potter was a big one. Um, if you ever go to the the Harry Potter website when the movies were coming out, you can actually explore, and there's different games you can play. Uh, to learn about Harry Potter. So when you go actually read the books or see the movies, you're like, oh, okay, I get, I get that reference now, right? Uh, and that kind of thing. So a lot of it is for marketing and advertising, to market, to make you understand and draw you in uh, to the whole um, product that they're selling. So very neat kind of idea. I, I like this. I like the whole marketing and advertising aspect of it. And there's a huge market for this. So you're, you know, you're in the game design program here, interact, interactive gaming program here at uh, Centennial College. Um, maybe you know, one of the aspects that we've talked about here, like uh, a game for uh, entertainment, um, which is you know, you're making a game that you like, a game for educational purposes, 
in marketing and advertising, those are areas are really growing. Uh, and there's there are people who create game the game developers for those areas are in high like it's becoming more and more in demand because websites now I mean seeing a gallery on a website now is is quite boring right I mean we've seen enough galleries where our, our web experience has evolved where the user experience is is really the key of, of why we make websites in the first place you want to get a good user experience if a website just gives you is just very functional and gives you some information that may be okay. But if you want to keep the, the, you know, the user coming back over and over again, you want some kind of interactive experience. And marketing and advertising, websites being a part of that, almost like a, an extension of marketing and advertising, there's tons and tons of games out there that, um, uh, that are people are, are, are kind of producing. And like it says here, they're called adver games, or they're you know, just like edutainment. Uh, I'm not sure if I like that term, adver games. It's not really something that, that's po that popular. We also mentioned things like tools like Flash or Java. I think nowadays it's kind of morphed into JavaScript with Canvas, right? Which you would learn if you took uh, my, my other course, Comp397, uh, web game programming. Um, you can do a lot of stuff there for marketing and advertising with Canvas. Um, some really good games come out of it. Uh, for example, you're, you're building games that are going to promote a particular movie. Uh, Chronicles of Riddick was okay. Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, meh. I'm not really a big fan. Batman Arkham Asylum, though. Come on, that for the comic franchise perspective, I can play that game over and over again. Even if I beat it, I'll play it again. I like playing it a bunch of times. And even though it's a little older now, um, it's something that really worked. I think they really hit it with that one. Whereas most games in the past, like things like Indiana Jones and those kind of things were, you know, horrible, right? Or Superman was probably one of the worst games on the Xbox if you ever played that game. It's like, what is it called? That and Up Man of Steel. Uh, Superman Returns. That was the worst game, one of the worst games in the Xbox they ever came out with, right? But again, it's to promote the movie, to get you interested in the movie. If you watch the movie, you can play Superman. You know, you can do these kind of things. Um, actually, they mentioned that a lot in, um, um, if you ever play any kind of uh, old school games, they came up with these these games, one, one after the other. It's Indiana Jones, Star Wars, all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, they didn't really work well, right? But, uh, but there's some that made it. And there's marketing and advertising with Guitar Hero. Again, you know what? I like, I like the idea of, uh, the pe this is the Pepsi Music Challenge. Uh, genres. So again, we talked about different kinds of games. I don't know if we have time to talk about genres before I move into um, more Blender stuff. So I want to talk more Blender stuff today too. Let's leave it here before we go into genres. Um, I think that's enough. We'll take a short break, 10 minutes, and we'll come back and we'll do more Blender. Okay. <laughs>